time to go verse by verse, but man, this is powerful. Some of the most important things that the Lord has shown me have been from this book. And this book is unique. It and Colossians are two of the letters that Paul wrote that are kind of unique in the way that they do things. The first three chapters of Ephesians are basically all about who you are in Christ and what you have. It's identity type of scriptures. And then the the last three chapters of the book of Ephesians are because of who we are, this is how we should act. And most people don't usually put these things together. They will either get focused on who they are and they get carried away with that and forget that we are the salt and the light of the earth and that we have an obligation to act certain ways. But But Ephesians put this in a balance that's really, really good. And I think that this will bless you and and be a real um, encouragement to you. So let's start here in Ephesians chapter 1. It starts, and again, I'm not going to be able to go verse by verse through the whole book, but a lot of Ephesians chapter 1 I will cover verse by verse. And it says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that this wasn't just Paul saying grace to you from him. This is from God. God is gracious towards you and God has released peace towards you. I could spend hours on this one thing because, again, most people don't practically believe this, but the truth is God is gracious towards you. God's not mad at you. He's not angry. He's not even in a bad mood. God loves you. And I know some of you are thinking, well, you don't know me. You don't know God. God loves you just like you are. Grace and peace is multiplied unto you. And then it says... and. These are some of the things I want to really highlight in this first chapter. In verse 3 it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This is what the Word says. Notice it didn't say that He can bless us. That if you will do certain things and meet a certain standard, He will bless you. This says He hath. It's already done. He's already blessed you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And most people are so controlled by what they see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. They are controlled by their physical circumstances that when the Bible says this, they just immediately unplug and say, well, it's not true in my life. I'm sick. The doctor just told me I'm going to die. Or I'm poor. I can't even pay my bills. Or I'm having relationship problems with my children, with my, with my mate or whatever. And people look at circumstances and they think this isn't true. But it is true. God has already commanded a blessing upon you. You don't have to get God to bless you. He's already blessed you. It doesn't automatically come to pass because you have to receive it by faith. But notice it says that it has already been done. I could literally, uh, I've got a teaching on this entitled, uh, You've Already Got It. And if you haven't seen that, I would encourage you to get that teaching. But the whole teaching is, a lot of it's based on Ephesians chapter 1, that you're already blessed, you're already healed, you're already delivered. You already have love, joy, and peace, and all of these things. You don't need to pray and ask God for it. You've already got it. What you need to do is begin to believe and receive what you have. Thank you for both of those amens. But again, most people are so dominated by what they see and experience that they think, look, this is just religious talk you've got. In reality, I am not blessed. But I'm telling you, in reality, you are blessed. You have to believe it in order to see it manifest. When you believe is not when God blesses you, it's already done. You know, I often liken it to this. It's like a television signal. Right now, there's television signals. There's radio signals in this room. You know, we're using a wireless microphone. This is sending an FM signal back there, and it's received, and then it's rebroadcast. There's not only this signal. There's all kinds of signals on in here. And if a person says, I don't believe it, why? Because you can't feel it? Because you can't hear it? 
That doesn't mean that the signal's not here. It just means that you aren't turned on and tuned into it. You aren't receiving it, but those signals are here. And all you'd have to do is to take a television set and plug it in, turn it on, tune it in to a frequency. And when you start seeing the image, it's not when the image is broadcast. It's already there. You just weren't receiving it. And it's the same thing with God. He has already blessed you with everything. Healing is already a done deal. You don't have to ask God to heal you. You don't have to ask God to bless you. I have people come forward in my meetings and they'll say, would you please pray that God would just show me his love, pour out his love in my life. No, I won't do that. And some people think, well, why not? What's wrong with that? That's an insult because he says he's already committed his love towards you. God has already released it. God loves you more than you could ever understand. There is not, it's not God that's turned the switch off. It's your set that's plugged in to the wrong station. You're tuned into the wrong thing. You're listening to the 10 spies network instead of listening to the two spies that have a faith report. And for you to say, oh God, would you please love me? That's an insult to God when he says, I loved you so much that I gave my son and all of these other scriptures, Romans chapter 5, he's commended his love toward us. You don't need God to love you. What you need to do is get your set fixed. You need to ask for a repairman. Amen. Instead of calling the station and say, would you start transmitting? What you need to do is say, would you please come fix my set? Would you help me to learn to receive? If a person would come to me and say, look, I know that God loves me. I know these scriptures, but man, I'm having a hard time focusing on it. I've just got this happening and that happening. Would you pray with me? I'm going to share some other scriptures with you right here in this chapter that talk about that. Yes, I'll pray with you to help you understand and receive, but I am not going to approach God like, God, would you please take away my depression and would you give me joy? The Bible says that you already have joy unspeakable and full of glory. It says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. I'm trying real hard not to stay on this one verse. But I could. The thing that really changed my life. I was born again when I was 8. When I was 18, I had a miraculous encounter with the Lord. I knew that God loved me intuitively, but I couldn't see it. I couldn't understand. How could God love me? I didn't love me. I wasn't doing everything right. I was an introvert. I was afraid to talk to people. And there was just so many things in my life that were wrong. And I just couldn't understand how God loved me. And the thing that turned my life around was when God revealed to me that I had a spirit. Most people don't acknowledge the spirit realm. They only recognize this physical body and then the mental, emotional part and that's who they think they are. But there is a spirit part of you that when you get born again, you become a brand new person and you become identical to Jesus in your spirit because it is his spirit that was sent into your heart. God is a spirit, John 4, 24, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In your spirit, you are already blessed. You've got the fullness of God on the inside of you if you're born again. If you aren't born again, we can take care of that tonight. We will give an invitation and you can come and make Jesus your Lord. And the moment you get born again, you have the fullness of the Godhead living in you bodily. And according to Galatians 5, and 23, you have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. These things are in you in abundance, but it's not in your mental, emotional part. It's not in your tangible physical body. It's in your spirit and it takes faith to release what is on the inside of you. But this is what changed my life is when I quit going by just how I felt and I started going by what the word of God said about me and my spirit. I started walking in this and, and this is what this is all about. Again, I could spend a lot of time on that. But look at all of the... I want to just read these verses and please... Pay attention to the terminology that's used. This is so important. This is awesome. So in verse 3, he hath blessed us. In verse 4, it says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy 
and without blame before Him in love. God chose you before He even created the world. That means it's not based on your performance. That means He didn't look at you and say, oh, they are so sincere. They're trying so hard. Now I'm going to release my power. Before you or I existed, before the world existed, God chose us. I can't fully explain that. I think that's beyond human ability to understand. But I can certainly receive it and believe that God loves me not because I'm lovely, but because He is love. And He hath chosen us. He chose you. Many are called, but few are chosen. You know what that's talking about? God calls everyone. Jesus died for the sins of the entire world. He wants every single person that has ever breathed to have relationship with Him, but not everybody will receive it. And so He chooses those who receive Him. And He, through His foreknowledge, knew that you and I would someday turn to Him and He chose you before you ever existed. Man, that's awesome. You are chosen. And if it happened before the foundation of the world, it's not according to your performance. You don't, God doesn't love you more when you do everything right and He doesn't love you less when you do everything wrong. Now you will love God more when you seek Him and keep your heart sensitive and turn off the junk and focus on the Word of God and live a holy life. You will love God more and you will receive more benefit because you are in tune with Him. But God doesn't love you more if you do things right. He doesn't love you less if you do things wrong. Man, I could preach on that for weeks. In the next verse it says, Having predestinated us. Notice the terminology. He's already done this. This is not something that's yet to come. You are already predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. None of these words are talking about your goodness, that you earned this, that because you've performed so well, God has chosen you and promoted you. No, he, he chose you before the foundation of the world. He pre predestined you according to his pleasure, his goodness. Again, I could unplug right here and I've got a teaching entitled How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will. Most people think that you just muddle through life the best you can and you ask God to bless what you're doing. God formed you with a purpose. Psalms 139. All of your days were written in His book before one of them existed. This is why abortion is just absolute murder. It is murder. And a person is a person from the moment of conception, has an absolute different DNA from the mother and stuff. And God, from the moment of your conception, he had a, well, actually, according to this verse, before the foundation of the world, he had already chosen you and predestined you. And God has a plan. And so it's not up to you to just do your own thing and ask God to bless it. What were you created for? What is God's purpose for your life? And you know, when I teach on this and have an entire conference on just how to find, follow, and fulfill God's will, I'll give invitations and it's not unusual to have 80% or 90% of a group like this stand and say, I don't know for sure that I'm doing what God wants me to do. I hope I am. But they don't know for sure. I can guarantee you, you aren't going to find God's will accidentally. You don't just stumble into it. It's not fate. You have to pursue it. Satan is going to fight you and try and divert your life away from God wants you to do. And if you don't have a goal set and know where you're going, there is no chance of you getting there. You need to find out what God's purpose is. You have been predestinated according to the pleasure of His goodwill. And in verse 6 it says, To the praise of the glory of His grace wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Did you know that this term accepted right here, the Greek word that is used here is only used one other time in Scripture. And that's in Luke chapter 1 where the angel Gabriel appeared unto Mary and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Mary was highly favored. That's the same Greek word. The only other time it's used is talking about you and me, that we are highly favored. We are accepted in the beloved. 
You know, some people exalt Mary, and I think that Mary was certainly blessed. What an honor to be chosen to be the mother of the Lord. But you know, Jesus even said that when a woman came and said, blessed are the womb that is the womb that bare thee and the paps that you've sucked. And he said, yea, rather blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. Jesus himself said that the people who receive him and his message that he came to bring are more blessed than his mother. This right here says that we are highly favored and blessed just like Mary was. I'm not trying to pull her down. I'm exalting you. I'm saying that you are blessed. You are highly favored. And notice that it didn't say that you could be blessed. You might be blessed. If you will do these things, God will bless you and highly favor you. You are already blessed and highly favored. It's done. Did you know everything you're praying for, God's already done it. It's already done. Some of you are saying, man, I need to be healed. 1 Peter 2.24, by whose stripes we were healed. It's already been done. You're already healed. Healing power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, already lives on the inside of you if you are born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have those two things, we will give you an opportunity before tonight's over to receive that. But if you are born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Not just a little token of it, not just a little taste of it, you have the same quality and quantity of power that raised Christ from the dead. You have the same faith. We have like precious faith is what the Apostle Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1. He said, Peter, an apostle to them that have obtained like precious faith. That's 2 Peter 1, 1. You have obtained. It's not something that you can obtain. You have obtained it. And it says through the righteousness of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ. You didn't obtain it through your works and through your efforts. You obtained it when you got born again. God gave you faith. It was one of those things that was listed in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. It's a fruit of the Spirit. You have the faith of Christ on the inside of you. Amen. And many of you are just looking at me like, brother, that you don't know me. You don't know you. You don't know the real you. You only know yourself after the flesh. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Henceforth we don't know any man after the flesh, because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. There is a part of you that is brand new. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And brothers and sisters, everything I'm saying here, it is an accomplished fact in your spirit. But if you don't know it, it doesn't benefit you. God's people perish for a lack of knowledge. It says in Philemon chapter 1 verse 6, Paul was praying a prayer for Philemon, his friend, and he says, I pray that the communication of your faith would become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. You can't acknowledge something that doesn't already exist. He didn't say the communication of your faith would be effectual by you praying more, by you fasting, by you getting people to lay hands on you and agree. It says it comes by acknowledging what you already have. I know what I'm saying goes right over the head of most people because again, we are so focused on this physical realm and we just look in the physical realm. And if I say that you're blessed financially, the first thing you do is look at your bank account. You look at your wallet and you judge whether what I'm saying is true based on your experience. I love you. I'm not saying this to hurt anybody. But if that's the way that you think, you're what the Bible calls carnal. Carnal doesn't mean just terrible, sinful, God-hater. Now, all of those people are carnal. But carnal means of the five senses. It means you are dominated and controlled by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And the vast majority of Christians are carnal, totally dominated by what they see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. So the Bible says you're blessed with all blessings and you go to your checkbook. Well, I'm not blessed. You're healed. Well, I'm not healed because you got a doctor's report. I'm not saying that those things don't exist, but there is more than just this physical world. There's more than, there's a spiritual world out here. There are demons and angels in this place tonight. 
And somebody says, I don't see them. If you don't believe it because you can't see them, you're carnal. Doesn't mean you're terrible. It doesn't mean you're sinful. It means you are limited to what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. God is a spirit. And for you to start seeing the power of God operating in your life, you've got to break loose from just being carnal and recognize that there's a spiritual world out there and there's also a spiritual world on the inside of you. There is a you on the inside that you don't know. A friend of mine, it might be... Uh, I forgot who this is, but anyway, some friend of mine, I think it was uh, Rich Van Winkle, wrote a book on identity, and he's got a person standing in front of a mirror, and you can kind of see over the person's shoulder, and you can see kind of what they look like, but the image in the mirror is a lion, <laughs> and he's talking about your identity, and would to God that we had some spiritual mirror that we could look in that would show you who you really are. Oh, we do. Right here. James chapter 1 says, Whoever looks into this perfect law of liberty is like a man beholding his face in a mirror. This is a representation of who you are. Who are you? You're blessed with all spiritual blessings. You are already chosen. You are already predestined. You are already accepted in the beloved the same way that Mary was. You are highly favored. In verse 7 it says, in whom we have redemption. Not that we can obtain redemption. We've already got redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Verse 8, wherein He hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence. And I wish I had time to just emphasize every one of these. I encourage you, when you go home, read this. Think about it. Everything that He's saying is in the past tense. It's not something that is obtainable if you would just do enough and if you would live holy enough and read the Bible enough and go to church. No, you've already got these things. You don't have to do anything to get it. You've already got it. Now you've got to do things to renew your mind and begin to understand and receive what God has done. But just understanding that God, I'm not changing you. You've already blessed me with everything. I've already got it. I'm not reading the Word so that you could bless me. I'm reading the Word to find out how blessed I am. There's a difference. And so He hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will. Notice again, He isn't going to make known. He has already done it. And some of you think, well, man, I don't, I don't know what God's will is. Your spirit man does. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, that you have the mind of Christ. It's not up here in your little peanut-sized brain. It's in your spirit. You have the mind of Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. And again, see, this is where carnal Christians disconnect. They think, I don't care what the Bible says, I don't know all things. I can't even find my glasses when they're on top of my head. I forget things all of the time. I just don't, the Bible is so hard to understand. It's not talking about your physical brain knows all things. Those of you that have been Bible college students can prove that. You take a test and man, you don't know all things. But your spirit man knows all things. Of uh, Colossians chapter, um, man, I just went blank on where this is. I think it's Colossians 2.10. But it says, put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Your spirit man has been renewed in knowledge. You know all things. You have an unction. You have the mind of Christ. And so instead of going around and saying, well, I just don't, I don't know. I can't understand the things of God. You're hung by your tongue. You're operating in the flesh, in the carnal realm, and you are blocking what God wants to do. In your spirit, you know all things. He's already abounded towards you. You've got wisdom. And I'm not going to take time right now, but I've got an entire series on this. Uh, you know, all of these things I'm saying, I've got... Multiple teachings that go into depth on each one of these. But your spirit man already has the mind of Christ 
And then it says when you pray in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, your spirit prays, the part of you that has the mind of Christ, that has this perfect knowledge. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says if you pray in tongues, pray also that you interpret. You know how you draw this mind of Christ out? Praying in tongues. You're speaking the hidden wisdom of God. Hebrews, I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, you are speaking mysteries and the wisdom of God. And all you got to do is just ask God, what am I saying? And that wisdom that's in your spirit will begin to flood out into your mind and God will reveal things to you. I tell you, if you don't speak in tongues, you need this gift of speaking in tongues. It is powerful. And if you have the gift of speaking in tongues, you need to use it. A lot of Christians receive it and they speak in tongues one time to prove to themselves that they have the Holy Spirit and then they don't use what they've got. But when you speak in tongues, it's just like flipping a switch and turning on the power of God. In verse 10, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained. Notice again the terminology, it's already done. We have obtained an inheritance. Some people think when I get to heaven, man, what a day that's going to be. In the sweet by and by, it'll be awesome. But I'm telling you in the rough now and now, you have the power of God. It's not just... You know, in the sweet by and by, it's steak on the plate while you wait. Amen. So we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Not something that could happen, that if you'll ask for it, it'll happen. No, you were already sealed. Everything that we've read so far is something that is already done. And if you don't perceive it in your life, if you can't see it, it's not because it's not done. It's because you're on the wrong channel. You're looking with your eyes and trying to feel with your physical feelings instead of walking by faith and perceiving who you really are in the Spirit. You've already got all of these things. And it says in verse 14, talking about the sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the, glory, unto the praise of his glory. This earnest is what we would talk today. It's a, it's a down payment. The Holy Spirit, this gift of speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit are like a down payment, a proof to us of what's in the unseen realm. When you, pre, when you speak in tongues, when you operate in a word of knowledge, those are physical proofs of the things that you can't see. They are manifested and it's our earnest. It's the proof of what we already have. In verse 15, he says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And notice this prayer through the end of this chapter. This is awesome. You know, when I first got turned on to the Lord and God began to start showing me that in the spirit I had these things even though I couldn't see them in my physical body and I couldn't see it in my physical realm. This is a prayer that I prayed nearly daily and I put my name in there because this is a prayer that Paul prayed. We know that he was led according to the Holy Spirit and the Bible says over in uh, Jane, uh, let's see, 1 John chapter 4, verse 15 this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've desired of him. So the whole key is, are you praying according to God's will? This is a prayer in the Bible that Paul was led to pray. You know that this is God's will. So all you got to do is just put your name in there and say, Father, instead of praying Paul, praying for the... Uh, Ephesians say, Father, I'm praying this that you would open up the eyes of my understanding. Just put your name in there. And there's also a prayer in the third chapter. I'll be dealing with that uh, sometime either tomorrow or the next day. But you pray those two prayers and you put your name in there and I tell you what, you know you have the petitions that you've desired of the Lord. 
And let me ask you this. If you were going to write down a prayer, let's say you were going to write out a prayer for somebody and it was going to be 2,000 years in the future, how would you, how would you pray for them? Think about that just for a second. What would you pray? How would you pray for them? And you know, I've literally been in thousands of churches and heard the prayers of people. And I can guarantee you that the prayer of most people would be something like, Oh God, bless these people. Which the Bible here says you're already blessed. Oh God, move. All of this says he's already moved. Oh God, pour out your spirit, which this, I'm going to read some scriptures to you. You've already got the same power that raised Christ from the dead. It's opposite what most of us would do. Most of us would say, God, please touch these people. Reveal yourself. Move in their life. Send revival. We would be asking God to do something. Paul is praying instead that you would get a revelation of what you've already got. Totally different than what most people are praying. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love to you, but if I, could, if I could listen to your individual prayers, I can guarantee you that the majority of people, and you guys are the cream of the crop. This is Thursday night. You came out to a convention center to listen to a hick from Texas. You're an absolute fanatic. Or you were drug here by a fanatic, one of the two. But I mean... You guys are the exception, and yet I bet you that the majority of people in here, when you pray, oh God, please heal me, instead of saying, thank you that by your stripes I was healed. Oh God, please pour out love in my life, instead of saying, I've got love, joy, and peace. And most of us are praying and asking God to do what he says he's already done. You know, if God could be confused, I believe he would be confused. I could see him looking at Jesus and saying, didn't you tell them that by your stripes they were healed? Why are these people begging me to heal them? Didn't you tell them? This prayer is completely different than the way most people pray. Instead of praying, oh God, touch them. Oh God, send revival. Oh God, move. It's oh God, open up their eyes to what they already have. That's one of the reasons that we aren't seeing the results that we should be seeing because we're praying wrong. So look at this prayer. He's praying this prayer. He ceases not to make mention of you, mentioning you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And if you want to be technical, if you go back over here to verse um, 9... It says he's already made known unto us the mystery of his will. So he's just praying that we would get revelation of what he's already done. God has actually given you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. You just need to start using what you've got. So he's praying that the Lord would give unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. And look at verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened... Man, I have studied every one of these words. I've actually preached messages on just one of these words. An hour. There is so much in this. This word understanding here is the Greek word dianoia. And it means deep thought. Not just thought, but deep thought. Most Christians are very superficial. They just get something and they say, Oh, praise God, by his stripes I'm healed. And they run with it. And then they get confused. Well, I believe by his stripes I'm healed. How come I'm not healed? You have to let that soak in on you. It has to go beyond a surface level. It has to become a heart revelation. Matter of fact, you know, I mentioned uh, Teresa and had her come up here. And in her book, this is one of the things that when she first came to school, she kept saying they were talking about revelation knowledge. And she was confused. What's revelation knowledge? And uh, you need to get her book and get her explanation. She does a great job on it. But there's a difference between just information and you being able to quote a scripture and then it becoming revelation to you to where it just ignites something on the inside. It releases something on the inside of you. And most Christians don't take the time. They're too busy. I mean, they got to go watch the Super Bowl. 
I'm not against the Super Bowl. I'm not against any of this stuff. But I'm saying we are so carnal. We are just plugged in. We spend so much time on the phone. Not talking to people. But playing games and looking up stuff. I just got more things to do than to play games. But we are so carnal. We're so controlled by this that we don't allow things to sink in. It's like taking a sponge. You can take a sponge and you can totally put it in water. But if you just put it below the surface and pull it back, it'll just get wet around the edges. It won't soak all the way through. You have to put that thing in there and submerge it. Did you know that this is what the word baptize means? Contrary to religious traditions, it doesn't mean to sprinkle. It doesn't mean to dip. It means to just hold them under until they really repent. (laughs) Amen. And you need to get baptized in the Word. You need to be so immersed in it that it saturates. It doesn't just go around the edges, but it literally becomes revelation to you. It comes alive. It becomes a part of you. This is what he's praying, that the eyes of your understanding, this deep thought, would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Notice it's his calling. People will say, God has called me to do this. Well, yes, it is true that he calls you, but it's really his calling. God's wanting to live through you. It's not supposed to be you. It's not your ministry. It's not your calling. It's not your vocation. Everything in your life should be Him. It's the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Did you know when you talk about the glory of God, most people close their eyes and think about heaven and the throne and Ezekiel 1 and 10 about the glory, the uh, rainbow around the throne and all of the seraphims and the living creatures and and they think of all of these things. But notice it says the riches of his, uh, of his glory in the saints. What you have on the... Man, I, I, it's hard for me to say this. I know that most people, it just it's wasted on saying it. But what you have on the inside of you, if it had to be replaced, it would bankrupt heaven. The glory in heaven. You've got that on the inside of you right now. It's glorious. You've got the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily. It's not out there someplace. We pray these stupid prayers about, Oh God, we come and ask you to meet with us today. What a stupid prayer. When he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst, and yet you say, come be with us. And oh God, go with us as we leave. How dumb can you get and still breathe? (laughs) I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but oh God, please go with me today. That prayer didn't get above the ceiling. You don't need a prayer to get above your nose. God's right here. That's the reason you bow your head when you pray, so you can look at God and say, Father. Man, the riches of the glory of His inheritance is in us. If you could hold up this spiritual mirror and believe what it says about you, right now I'm showing you who you are in the Spirit. It's awesome. I can't relate to people that get depressed. You know, it's now been 53 years since the Lord touched my life. And I guess maybe until I got this revelation, it it might be 50 years since I've been depressed or discouraged. I don't get depressed. You can't make me depressed. You know why? Because I'm not focused on the natural things and even my own limitations and my own failures... I'm looking at who I am in Christ. And when you see that you have the riches of the glory of His inheritance on the inside of you, how could you be depressed? How could you be lonely? I don't understand people being lonely. If you're lonely, it's because you are living in the physical realm and you are looking for physical people to come love you. But man, God Almighty loves you. And if you focused on that, You could just bask in His presence. You don't need anybody else. 
Now, I'm not, I'm not ignorant of the fact that we need each other and I'm not telling you to go move out someplace and never see another person. But I'm saying that if you are... If, if your joy and peace and happiness is dependent upon other people, you are carnal. Amen or oh me. The riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. And then, remember in verse 18, he's praying that your eyes would be open to this. In verse 19, he says, and that you would see what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. That word according to means in proportion to or to the degree of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Man, again, we could just go into every one of these words. They're powerful. But notice, the power that's directed towards you is the same power that he used when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And yet I have people come to me all the time and say, I know that God can heal. I know that he wants to do this, but I just don't have any power. You're denying this. You have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And I guarantee you that's enough to raise you from the dead. You know, when God created the heavens and the earth, there was zero opposition. There wasn't a devil yet. He had no opposition. Creating the universe is nothing compared to raising Jesus from the dead because when Jesus rose from the dead, Satan and every demon in hell was doing everything they could to stop that from happening. You know, a church that I used to go to, they had an Easter presentation that was elaborate and they went into these great things. And anyway, the resurrection scene, they had the tomb covered and then you heard this explosion and there was this huge amount of smoke that you couldn't see anything for a moment. And as it began to clear, you saw this person who was personified as the devil. He had been in the play the whole time. He was underneath the tombstone. The tombstone was on top of him and Jesus was standing on top of the tombstone. That was a great picture of what the resurrection was like. And I can guarantee you Satan and all of his demons were trying to stop that tomb from being opened up and yet Jesus blew the gates off of hell and came out with the keys of death and of hell. And he overcame all of the opposition and you have that raising from the dead power on the inside of you. It's not out there somewhere that you have to say, oh God, stretch forth your hand and just touch this person. Oh God, come and be with us. You've already got the supernatural raising from the dead power on the inside of you. There is nothing that God has to do. He's already done it. He's put everything on the inside of you. It's up to you and me to release what God has done through faith. Faith doesn't make God respond to us. Faith is our positive response to Him. Faith is reaching out and appropriating what He's already provided. And I'm telling you, every one of you in here, if you think you're the sorriest Christian in this whole place, you still have the supernatural raising from the dead power on the inside of you. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, talking about John the Baptist, he was the greatest man that had ever been born among women. That included just about everybody. Greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, greater than anybody. John the Baptist was the greatest. Nevertheless, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. If you are the least saint in this auditorium tonight, you're greater than John the Baptist, which means you're greater than Moses, greater than Elijah. You've got more power, and it's all because in your spirit you have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You do not have a power problem. You've got a knowledge problem. Over in 2 Peter chapter 1, Verse 3, it says, great, or I guess it's verse 2 or 3, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of him that hath called you to glory and virtue. And yet most Christians, oh God, please just give me more peace. I'm stressed out. Could you give me peace? It says grace and peace is multiplied unto you through knowledge, not through prayer. 
And then the next verse says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things. And in the Greek, that means all things. <laughs> all things. That includes healing. That includes prosperity. That includes vision. That includes deliverance from fear and depression and loneliness. All things that pertain unto life and godliness have been given unto us through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. If you're sick tonight, you got a knowledge problem. You don't have a power problem. You've got the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You don't know what you've got. And you're asking God to give you what you've already got. You know, before I've gone down and given my Bible, I'll get off the stage and do this. But here, I give my Bible to Matt. So Matt's got my Bible. And then Matt says, Andrew, could I have your Bible? Yes. How do I respond to a person that's already got what they're asking for? I just probably look at Matt like your elevator doesn't go all the way to the top floor. Something's wrong with you. I, or I probably just wouldn't say anything because how do you respond to somebody who's asking you for what they've already got? I'd probably just be quiet, kind of like it is when we pray. And we're asking God to heal us and we don't hear anything and we say, God, what's wrong? And he's saying, you've got it. I gave you the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Give me my Bible. <laughs> but how do you ask God for something that he's already given you? Oh, praise God. I'm young. But when you, you're saying, oh God, heal me. And he says, by his stripes, you were healed. I put within you the same power that raised Christ from the dead. What do you want me to do? You know, I heard Kenneth Copeland. For those of you who don't know, Kenneth Copeland is Jeremy's grandfather. Man, what a blessing. But I heard Kenneth Copeland one time and he was saying that he wanted to see more people healed and more things done. And he was just saying, oh God, give me more power. And the Lord stopped him and said, Kenneth, where am I going to get any more power? I've already given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness. you got the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Where am I going to get any more power? And again, there's some people that are listening to me right now and you're just disconnecting thinking, but I don't have any of that. You're, looking, you're, you're waiting on a feeling in your body or you're wanting some kind of an epiphany or... Somebody just to remove all doubt and stuff. You've got to perceive this by revelation knowledge. It has to be by faith that you see into the spiritual realm. But I'm promising you, brothers and sisters, you've got everything that you need already. You've got more than what you need. More unbelief. More doubt. More carnality. We don't have a lack of anything. There's a song that I've been singing lately that's become one of my favorite and it says, What gift of grace is Jesus our Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. Man, that is profound. Did you know when you're saying, Oh God, I just need this and I need that, you, you aren't esteeming Jesus. You aren't understanding what He's done. Jesus has already done everything. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He's not there still purchasing things, still doing things. God isn't healing people today. He healed you 2,000 years ago. People are receiving their healing today. They're turning on their set and tuning in and receiving what has already been broadcast. But you aren't waiting on God to heal you. God is waiting on you to believe. And so take this prayer, and I don't think I finished all of this, but pray that God would open up the eyes of your understanding and show you the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe. The same power that He used when He raised Jesus Christ from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Every name. Did you know cancer has a name? Jesus is above that. 
AIDS has a name. Sugar diabetes has a name. Multiple sclerosis. Anything you want to name. Jesus is above that. And the power that's on the inside of you is greater than anything that Satan could come against you with. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17. No weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. No weapon will prosper, but notice you have to condemn it. When you sit there and the doctor says you're going to die and somebody says, how are you? And you say, well, I'm going to die. You didn't condemn it. You agreed with it. You've empowered it. You're hung by your tongue. You've got to get to where you start condemning those negative things. and It doesn't mean that you deny that there's a problem in the physical realm. Faith isn't denying that bad things exist. It's just denying that that's all there is to it. It's just denying that the physical natural world is all there is. There's also a spiritual world and who I am in Christ is greater than what I feel in my body. And so I don't deny that I may have a problem, but I deny that that is going to win. I have the same power on the inside of me that raised Christ from the dead and praise God, I start speaking that and I release it. But you have that same power. It's greater than all authority and power and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet. We are the feet of the body of Christ. He is the head. We are the feet. Everything is placed under you. You have authority over the devil, over all devils. There is no devil that you don't have authority over. Man, that's awesome. I, I, I'm trying to restrain myself. He's put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you've got everything in Christ. There is no more for heaven to give. You've got it all. You've got Christ. You've got everything that he is. And you didn't get just a baby Christ. You didn't get just a little Christ and you've got to grow into this. Your spirit man's already grown. Your spirit man is complete. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. 1 John 4, 17. Jesus is not a baby. Jesus isn't still growing spiritually. Your spirit man is 100% complete and pure. It's your soul that's growing in its knowledge and understanding and the ability to walk in faith. Your soul is a part of you that is being renewed and that is growing in Christ. But your spirit man is identical to Jesus. If you could understand the things that we're saying right here, it would change the image on the inside of you. And most of us, have a self-fulfilling... Well, let me say it differently. All of us have a self-fulfilling prophecy. However you see yourself being is the way that you are. And some of you are thinking, well, man, I'm dying and I never saw myself dying. It's not like I saw this. It's not like I believe for it. But no, you saw yourself as only human. You saw yourself as cancer is bigger than me. And so therefore, cancer is able to dominate you. But you can get to a place to where cancer has no power over me. That's a name. And I've got authority above every name. And you can see yourself in Christ. And again, you don't deny that cancer exists, but you just deny that it has the right to exist in you. You know, this virus that we've been dealing with, and again, I'm not condemning anybody. I know that we're all at different places and stuff, but don't condemn me for believing what the Word says either. But the Bible says no plague will come nigh my dwelling. And I believe, I believe that no plague, no germ can touch my body and live. And I have prayed with hundreds, maybe thousands of people who've been sick and stuff. And I don't get sick. I'm not going to get sick. I don't believe in being sick. It's been decades since I've been sick. And somebody says, I don't believe that. Well, then it won't work for you. <laughs> but I believe it. I, you know, let me just share one last scripture with you before I quit tonight. But in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 25, let me turn over and read this to you. 
Man, this is powerful. I've been meditating on this quite a bit. Exodus chapter 23 and in verse 25. It says, uh, am I in the right place? That's not it. Maybe it's 25, 23. Where is it, that, where is it, Jamie? It's on your little thing that you wrote out on. Anyway, here's what it says. I can quote it to you. You shall serve the Lord your God, and He will bless your bread and your water, and He will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Where is it? 23, 25. Well, I thought I was looking there. I must have been on the wrong place. But anyway, here's the point. It says, I will take sickness away. Did you know that that word take and the word away is the same word? And I'm not sure I can pronounce it. It's something like sur in the Hebrew. But it literally, here's what the definition of that word is. Turn off is what that word means. That's all it means. I will turn off sickness. And it says it before the word sickness and after the word sickness. I will turn off sickness, turn off away from the midst of thee. And I was meditating on this. You know, Jesus, he became sin for you that when he walked on this earth, Jesus didn't get sick. Because you, that's a result of the fall. We have a propensity to sickness in this fallen body. But when you serve the Lord, he will bless your bread and your water and turn off sickness. Turn off your receptiveness to sickness. And that's what I believe. I don't believe I can get sick. I believe I could if I quit believing. But I believe that I'm blessed. No plague comes nigh my dwelling. And I'm not afraid of sickness. And I don't get sick. I remember talking to Karen Jolly down here one time and we were talking something about healing and anyway, she said something and I said, I don't believe in getting sick and I remember she just looked at me like, what? And I said, I don't believe in getting sick. I don't get sick. You don't have to be sick. I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. I think you're weird to have these promises of God and to have the supernatural power of God, the same power that raised Christ from the dead and you aren't going to operate in it. Well, I'm only human. I'm not only human. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. I've got the power of God living on the inside of me. And to the degree that I can believe what God has done and receive it, I can walk in this right now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't have to wait to the sweet by and by. I can walk in the supernatural power of God now if I will take these scriptures and pray and say, God, open up my eyes and help me to see what I've got the exceeding greatness of your power towards me, the same power that you used when you raised Christ from the dead, that ought to be enough for your headache, for your hangnail, for cancer. Cancer's nothing. It's not a big deal. Unless you make it a big deal. Unless you listen to the 10 Spies Network that tells you all of the bad stuff instead of the ones who are telling you what the Word of God says. Brothers and sisters, God has blessed us with everything that you need. God has not failed a single one. Sometimes people look at certain people and think, well, you're super saints. Things work for you. They don't work for me. And so we put people on pedestals and think that you've got to come and let some anointed person pray for you. God uses people. I'm not saying that he doesn't. And if God waited until we were all perfect before you received, there'd be a lot of dead Christians. And so, yes, we do receive one from another. And I'm going to give you an opportunity tonight to come and receive prayer. And I'm not against that. But I'm saying that that's just a temporary measure until you come to the place that you realize who you are and what God has done. But every one of you who are born again already have this same power on the inside of you. You don't lack anything except knowledge. 
the communication of your faith becomes effectual by acknowledging the good things that are on the inside of you. And likewise, the lack of our faith working comes because we don't acknowledge the things that we've got. We're looking at ourselves just in the mirror and searching only our physical, emotional part. And we don't know who we are in the spirit. I'm telling you, in the spirit, you've got more power than the devil, more power than cancer, more power than poverty, more power than depression. You've got whatever it is that you need. You do not have a power problem. You've got a knowledge problem. And praise God, we're going to make a dent in that this week as we minister the Word of God. So, Father, we thank you for these truths. Thank you for what the Word of God says. And I'm just praying this same prayer that Paul prayed 2,000 years ago. That, Father, you would open up the eyes of our understanding, our deep thought, that we would begin to understand what you have done and quit looking at our problems as being bigger than us. That, Father, you would help us to see the exceeding greatness of your power that you have given us, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you right now, even though you can't see it and it's not quite revelation to you, by faith, just start praising God that you do have this power. Even if you don't feel it, even if you don't understand it, just by faith, thank God. Thank you, Father, that you did not leave us powerless. That you gave unto us everything that we needed to totally overcome in every area of our life. Even if we haven't seen it manifest in our life, in our body, in our finances, in our emotions, we believe we've got it. And Father, we thank you for that. We just praise you and believe that you will use these meetings this week to help open up the eyes of people's understanding that they would see what they've got that they would not just see it but they would embrace it and become fully persuaded who they are in Christ Father we thank you and I believe that's why you brought us together and I praise you in advance that this is going to change people's lives